So what uh, we wanted to do here, as the ambition was, and Bobby kind of asked, was maybe to push the envelope a little bit and see if we could come up with some examples of some, we might call them collaborations, maybe they're PPPs, maybe they're what's more commonly said we call governance networks involving many different kinds of groups, but we'll see. But to ask the panelists to identify a particular project that they're aware of that they think might be a little more innovative, a little different, a little more cutting edge than what you might otherwise um, have heard. And then to talk a little bit about what made that particular project or aspect of that project successful. So maybe some um, early ideas of some new thinking or things we might learn about for future projects and the like. So I'm just to um, introduce um, the panelists and since you have the biomaterial, I hope, but going in uh, this direction, uh, Jim Thompson, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Jonathan Jacoby, who's manager, private sector development for Oxfam America. Barbara Spann, who's vice president uh, in public affairs for Western Union. Um, Dennis Whittle, president of Whittle Group and co-founder of Global Giving. And then all the way at the end is Jim Thompson, deputy special representative, global partnership initiative for the State Department. So the plan is to kind of go through the panelists twice. First, to ask them to just describe briefly what project they may have identified and go in order and to get you some sense of those. And then to go back again and then to ask them perhaps to identify what aspect they thought was a particularly compelling one, uh, might have made a difference in some investment decision, might have changed the dynamic than otherwise would have been. So that's, that's routine. And then if we get through all that successfully, that should leave enough time for any number of questions to talk more about the projects and, and what they think about them. So, so with that, thanks very much for all the panelists. And uh, Jonathan, if you don't mind starting. Sure. Uh, pleasure to be here. I just, I've never seen such an intimidating uh, environment. <laughs> Uh, or like literally reach your audience would take the go-go gadget arms from uh, Inspector Gadget from when I was growing up. Uh, and um, but it, it's it's great to be here. And it, it, my, I was hard pressed to get here any earlier than about uh, the last ten minutes of the last panel. So I'm sure there's already been a really compelling range of uh, talks and, and discussion. The definition of partnership came up in, a few, in, in the final question. I'm sure that's on the table for every one of these panels because it's uh, it's a moving target. Um, partnership for me, especially today, is, uh, um, you know, I start with thinking about my own partnership with my wife because I'm on my way to my honeymoon tonight. Um, and so I have my mind on a million and one things, but I'm very excited to have the chance to do this panel uh, and to get a flight out of National at 8 o'clock on Friday that is not so expensive. Uh, so, um, I'm um, going to talk a bit about, um, you know, what we'd call at Oxfam, or, or at least Oxfam America's marquee project in engaging um, the private sector uh, partnership we're proud of and give some insight and Q&A will give some more time for getting into details, I'm sure, um, and have other colleagues certainly working on it. But um, just to preface, uh, considering that uh, you know, folks uh, may be familiar with Oxfam often are, but uh, just to summarize, we are an international development and humanitarian organization. Uh, Oxfam America is based in Boston. Um, our oldest and largest uh, of our Oxfam family is within is in uh, based in Oxford, England. Uh, that's where we get our name. Um, and so we are um, based, you know, in 15 different affi national affiliates, uh, primarily in the global north, but increasingly in the global south, uh, which is an interesting trend. And then our projects, um, such as these, are in about 100 countries around the globe, uh, focused on um, rural livelihoods in particular, uh, and shoring up people's access to. Um, resources and also to power. Um, and I, our, our project kind of comes out of a private sector department that we developed six years ago at Oxfam America, and the idea was we need a um, way to engage more formally with uh, increasingly important actors, companies and investors um, who have an impact, uh, have a footprint, so to speak, in, in the realm of poverty and development. Um, Oxfam had traditionally focused on the negative footprint, and now we focus really on the mix and the complex mix of uh, positive and negative footprints that companies and investors do have um, in the development arena and to see where we can um, go deep with a company if there's an opportunity to partner and we find that there's um, you know, a credible and scalable and systemic impact we can make through a pilot and that, that's where I'll, I'll head with this example uh, and then we continue to campaign as we're traditionally known where we think we can shift industry practice and behavior in a more pro-poor direction and we look for coalitions and sometimes companies themselves 
are part of those coalitions. They're advocating for public policy change or industry change. Uh, it's a more complex um, and nuanced uh, engagement than, than it used to be. So uh, I'll tell you a bit about how one has segued to the other. So our project that I wanted to highlight is a uh, focused on, it's called Harida initially, um, and it's a uh, project in the Horn of Africa. Uh, that's the uh, HA part. The, the RIDA part is risk transfer for adaptation. Uh, and what we mean by that is climate change adaptation is a challenge posed to uh, the global poor. It, it's sort of insult to injury that the poor, having had very little to do with the emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, then have to bear the disproportionate brunt uh, of, of the impacts of climate change, the sea level rise, the increasing and in, uh, more severe and frequent storms, um, drought in some areas, flood in other areas, and drought and flood in some of the same areas often, because this is the volatility that we're talking about. So we then saw uh, a particular conversation bearing fruit uh, with Swiss Re, a reinsurance uh, company based obviously in Switzerland, but with major operations here in the US, where we could innovate a form of microinsurance, which was not brand new as a concept, but in a certain, in various ways we were able to come up with a new way to apply the, the model of microinsurance and embed it in what we call a rural resilience scheme. Um, hard to pronounce, but the idea of rural resilience is of course that <coughs> farmers can bounce back from climate shocks and insurance, at least in the, in the climate change context, is a very useful technology, you can say, a soft technology or a service that allows many of us, uh, without thinking about it, to um, face an extreme weather event uh, and weather that storm. So for farmers who had, number one, not heard of the concept of insurance and may in some cases be enumerate or literate, to then access this market, uh, but make use of this product in the context of taking more risk, because that's actually what we need farmers to do if they're gonna increase their yields, but to know that there's that cushion in case drought arrives, uh, the concept of insurance kind of embeds um, within uh, the technical assistance we are offering to communities. So in the north of Ethiopia, we piloted in the village of Adiha. Um, it's in Tigray region. Uh, we had a local NGO that we worked with and funded for several decades at that point. So a lot of local trust built up as well as a strong office in Addis. And then see, marrying, you know, the partners meant Swiss Re seeing an opportunity as a reinsurer to enable an insurer, namely Niala Insurance uh, in Ethiopia, to take a chance and offer insurance to a population that they otherwise would not have. Um, there's an MFI, a microfinance institution, involved uh, in the actual uh, you know, uh, transaction of the insurance. And what's innovative about it, among other things, is one, or twofold, two innovations I'll mention. One is the um, community co-design, uh, in essence, working through even um, in form of a board game, working through the concept of insurance and how this could be Made to, made to be useful, and of course made to be affordable. And one of the innovations that then came out of that community co-design was making it affordable, not through then, you know, their own, um, you, know, uh, you know, they'd be hard pressed to pay for it typically with the earnings from their, their TEF farms, um, a local staple, but through a cash for work program um, run by the Ethiopian government with a number of international donors supporting, uh, it's known as the Productive Safety Net Program. Uh, it reaches eight million households, including in this area of Ethiopia. So the innovation then being that we could piggyback on that, and instead of the cash for work, it was an insurance, microinsurance premium for work uh, that they then can access, and knowing that they receive a payout in the, in the event of a drought. And we worked with Columbia um, Universities, um, at the Earth Institutes, um, you know, the institute that's focused within the Earth Institute on uh, climate research data to use satellite data to kind of develop a band into which we could then very easily measure rainfall within the community, both satellite and backup rainfall gauges very simply. And if the rainfall falls outside of that band for a given harvest uh, or for a given season, the growing season, then there's, it triggers a payout. And actually it's timely because just within the last week, we've, after experimenting and growing this program um, now to 1,300 households uh, across a number of villages in Ethiopia, we had our first payout. Uh, so the farmers, you know, have a sense that this is going to pay off for them if they access this program. In the last first two seasons, thankfully, there was no payout in a sense because there was no drought. Um, but in another sense, you want proof of concept um, for the idea that, that there's incentive to stay involved. So uh, I can say more later, but just those two innovations of community design and of piggybacking on an existing government program to enable the, uh, uh, the transaction to work in essence because you would not have a chance for 
farmers of, this, of these beans to um, pay in the open market, but Swiss Re increasingly sees that they're not just doing a philanthropic activity, it's a market-based activity. Great. All right. Thank you. That's a great summary. Um, Barbara? You know, I, I too came in about 10 minutes before the end of the, at the last session, and I was disappointed to uh, do so. I got caught in a, in a hallway conversation. And, but when I came in, somebody was asking questions and talking about government rules and laws uh, around uh, public-private partnership. And I <coughs> almost stood up and screamed, no, <laughs> no, you know, you can get ca caught in a quagmire, uh, coming from a private sector company, caught in such a quagmire <coughs> of those things that the, uh, that the uh, business initiatives and the partnerships you're, you're working on don't get to the root cause of whatever it is they're trying to address. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, I'm going to talk about a, an initiative that uh, we've done. It's a public-private partnership, if one wants to use that term, uh, with uh, USAID and Western Union, a combination of parties of Western Union, the Western Union Foundation and the Western Union Company. I'm from the Western Union uh, Company. And uh, when we look at public-private partnerships and our private sector investment, uh, there are things that the foundation does which are traditional. You know, uh, they have a partnership with Mercy Corps where they make donations into Mercy Corps initiatives that address, um, you know, uh, starting small businesses or education or, or uh, microfinance, whatever those initiatives are. And that's really a philanthropic uh, initiative. This public-private partnership really focuses on private sector investment. And by that, I don't mean writing a big check that goes into an NGO-operated program. Those have their place. It goes into an NGO-operated program somewhere in a country or region, and then allowing that NGO to just run with it and staying out of it. I'm talking about investment into privately owned by individuals for-profit businesses, usually SMEs, <coughs> small, medium-sized business enterprises, that can be sustainable and not sustainable in the way of they have enough funding from whatever the funding source is to get them through a few years. We're talking for-profit, so these are businesses that are employing people, paying taxes, building industry sectors that have the potential uh, for growth in a country or in a region. Um, the particular initiative I'm going to be talking about is called the African Diaspora Marketplace. We first conducted it as a pilot starting in 2009, and now we are on the second round. Uh, what the ADM is, is it was initially uh, positioned as a business competition. Western Union and uh, our agents and partners and USAID put in $1.4 million into a funding pool and, uh, and uh, put out a request for business proposals to African diaspora living in the U.S. to invest in, uh, start or grow businesses in their countries of origin in Africa. So there had to be a percent of ownership from the diaspora here in the U.S. and some level of ownership and partnership on the ground, uh, on the ground in their countries in Africa. Now there are a lot of business competitions out there and, and you hear a lot about them and they come and they go and usually it requires funding from some uh, funders like us or universities uh, or others and that model is not in and of itself sustainable. But uh, one, one of the reasons why we're continuing a second round uh, with this business competition, which by the way funded 14 businesses in seven countries um, starting in 2010 and uh, all those businesses are still operational. We expect about seven or eight of them, based on the monitoring and evaluation, we've done about seven or eight of them to achieve that profitability, sustainable, three of them are profitable already in 18 months. Profitability and sustainability for the long term. That's a 50% success rate in SMEs. And why is it? We didn't write a big check and turn it over to somebody else to run a program. We rolled up our sleeves and really got engaged in an everyday kind of, in an everyday kind of uh, way with guidelines and uh, uh, follow through with these businesses. 
uh, and that led us from a pilot to a second stage. We're using the learning from the first stage. We're trying to build out not just a business competition, but create linkages to uh, linkages to venture capital, to uh, uh, mentoring, <coughs> to uh, all kinds of other organizations out there. Mostly not government entities, mostly private foundations and entities, because uh, we can move more quickly that way um, without the same set of rules and rules and rules and rules, um, and uh, really create something that then we can step away from, which will have a lasting network and capacity to uh, move uh, private, for-profit businesses forward uh, on the ground in Africa. That's great. Thank you so much. All right, Dennis, your turn next. Uh, that's great, by the way. I hadn't heard about that, and that's really encouraging. You know, I think if there's one thing that we've learned uh, in development over the last 50 years, it's that there's no silver bullets, and that big grand plans don't work, and big integrated projects don't work. And uh, in some at least in my mind, the whole concept of big grand plans and big projects kind of came to a close a decade ago in the development field. And we're seeing now the last gasp of some of these things, the Millennium Villages, things like that. These are the exceptions that prove the rule, and they're uh, winding down. And, and it's play, in the place of the idea of the big grand plans that we pursued for so long was is the idea that the only way to make progress is uh, to experiment a lot, learn from the experimentation, adapt, and then try to scale the things that work, sort of what you were talking about. <clears throat> and I think we are, on the, on the horizon is really a renaissance of the development industry around some of these concepts of experimentation, learning, adaptation, a lot of failure along the way, but uh, learning from a lot of incremental things. There, there really is a renaissance, I think, about to happen. And at the beginning, uh, Public policy, I mean public-private uh, partnerships were, I think, 10 years ago seen as another silver bullet that was going to be the next phase. And there was a lot of clapping going on and uh, uh, when the first ones were started. But then the following decade really was a decade of sober experimentation. And you're looking at, you're looking at the guy who has overseen a lot of that experimentation. And some things worked, a lot of things didn't but we learned a lot of lessons along the way. And I think a big issue for donors um, all along the way, and I don't know why I'm speaking, Jim should be speaking to this, but it's how do you figure out which private companies have good intentions? How do you know that Western Union is not just taking you to the cleaners in this thing, and that they're using this money for their own private environment? How do you know that Coca-Cola is not, you know, this is something that I'm sure kept Jim awake many nights. But now, after a decade, we've got a track record of a lot of companies that have done good things and really proven that they're in it for public good as well as private good. And that's a good sign. And we also see, or what I see from my perch at Global Giving, is the rise of a whole new management class at companies. The old guard's kind of gone. The old uh, CSR guard, the people in the foundation, so you couldn't fire, so you stuck with the head of the foundation. That gang is gone. And in their place is a new class of managers who really care about the world. And yeah, it's great to work for Western Union Company or Coca-Cola, but also you want to go home to your kids at night and look them in the eye and say that you're going to try to leave the world a better place. And so this new, riot, this new cadre of managers that are arising is making it a little bit easier, and I'd be interested in Jim's reaction to that, for public agencies to trust partnerships with private companies. From the side of the private companies, it's a real pain in the butt to do business with World Bank, USA, UN. It's just, I mean, I've been on both sides of the equation. And it is, we used to joke at the World Bank that only a company that was a real loser would want to do business with us. <laughs> it must not have anything else better to do than to come knocking on our door because the cost of dealing with us was so high. So it's kind of a moral hazard problem. Anybody that wanted to join the, your club was not anybody you wanted in your club. <laughs> um, but again, fortunately, new mechanisms have, have arisen to try to drive the cost down of this. And in the year 2000, we did the development marketplace at the World Bank, which is the first time we just literally opened the front doors and invited anyone in. 
And USAID started this very ambitious Global Development Alliance program in the early 2000s, uh, and now has the Development Innovation Ventures. DFID is doing some really interesting stuff. And all of these things are reducing the cost of doing business with, uh, with uh, uh, public agencies. So now you are getting the Western unions coming and saying, you know, it's worth our while to invest our scarce resources in trying to deal with it. I don't know. I shouldn't speak on behalf of Western Union. I don't know here. But presumably it was worth Western Union's while. So the question in my mind now is what's going to keep, what's going to help consolidate these early gains in, that we're seeing in, in, in these partnerships? What's going to keep the procurement guys and the lawyers at bay? As soon as Jim leaves, what's going to keep these conservative forces inside aid agencies from pushing out the Western Union uh, marketplaces in Africa and going back to the same old same? And I, I, I assume, and I'm just guessing, that Jim every day fights battles with the conservative forces in the aid agencies. And when I think about that, the only way that we're going to keep them at bay is through demonstrating impact. And if we can find a way of really of what we did. What did you think of this project that USA did with Coca-Cola? What did you think of this project that the World Bank did with, with Western Union? Did you want it to begin with? And if you did, how did it go during the implementation? Now, if you think about it, we've never done that really on any scale before. Of course, we've done some surveys in villages, et cetera. But never have we had the ability to uh, uh, reach people on an incredibly wide scale and ask their opinion about things. And this, I think, to achieve this will require the ultimate public-private partnership. And we've seen things like M-Pesa, the mobile money company in Kenya that's really revolutionized banking in Kenya, which is a public-private partnership. We see things like Ushahidi, where you can map uh, uh, outbreaks of violence or uh, disaster-related problems in countries. Um, a whole bunch of things are out there being tried now, and the, uh, I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think the, the, the exciting things on the horizon are things like kind of a Yelp for uh, development to arise. And uh, uh, at Global Giving, we've been, uh, we're getting ready to experiment with a Google product called TalkBen that allows people just to text in very easily what they think about a project. Uh, and uh, can you imagine if you were a uh, program officer at USAID or World Bank or wherever, and you're getting texts all day from people in the community saying, you know, if the, school, if the teacher didn't show up or the school is lousy or, or whatever, um, this would be uh, quite a change. The other thing we're doing in collaboration with uh, a private company in Oxford and the Rockefeller Foundation is going into villages and just allowing people to tell stories about what's important to them even before we have a project in mind. Instead of us coming in and saying, we know what the problems are, <clears throat> we're going into the communities and saying, what matters to you? And what things have you seen in the past that have helped address that successfully? And kind of reversing the development equation so that we ask them first what they want, rather than us coming in with what we want. And then on the back end of that, uh, finding out from similar uh, methods what they thought of the intervention that was deliver to them in response to that. Um, so maybe in the next round I can talk more specifics, but I really do think, just to summarize, that it's a renaissance, we're on the horizon, a renaissance is on the horizon, and uh, you know the clapping has died down from the old experiments with, per with uh, public-private uh, partnerships, uh, but we really are on the verge of doing something uh, very meaningful in the next decade ahead. So I, I think it's going to be exciting, it's an exciting time. For those of you who think about being in development, this is a really exciting time. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, and then finally, Jim. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I have the best job in government. I'll be perfectly frank with you. Working on public-private partnerships, working with incredible companies like Western Union, um, for-profit organizations like Global Giving, Oxfam, the NGO community. My job is outreach. My job is, uh, I'm a Yenta. Uh, I'm a matchmaker. I, I see opportunities, I see linkages, and I bring them together. Listening, and I, again, I missed the morning, but I was here for the afternoon, listening to um, Bruce from TechnoServe talking about the work that they're doing with General Mills, and I introduced them. Um, hearing about Walmart uh, and the work that they're doing in Guatemala, I funded that, um, and ended up on the Walmart watch list, which was really interesting. Um, 
I'm really lucky because I've now done this for a couple different agencies. I, I was at USAID for uh, 14 years. Uh, I've been at State now going on four years. And uh, I've been really lucky in the fact that I've had amazing bosses. Uh, Holly Wise, who launched the Global Development Alliance, was a true pioneer at USAID, building public-private partnerships. Uh, and there, I commend to you, there's a report out by the Center for Strategic International Studies on public-private partnerships and what's working and what's not working uh, that Holly Wise co-authored with Dan Rundy, another former director of GDA. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, really lucky to have ended up at the State Department when Hillary Rodham Clinton came in as our Secretary of State. Could not have been a better job for the Secretary. I think she wanted one other job, but you know, this was a pretty good second choice. Um, she has been an amazing Secretary she lives and breathes partnerships. This is who she is. Um, she, when she was first lady of Arkansas, she brought Mohammed Yunus to Arkansas to talk about microfinance, because she understood the power of it and what it could mean for people in Arkansas. Uh, when she was junior senator from New York, she created a farm to fork program, bringing upstate farmers to downstate markets in New York City um, to bring produce from the state so they weren't buying just from California, that they were buying locally. Uh, she worked with the Irish diaspora to create the peace accords in Northern Ireland, uh, both Catholics and Protestant, Catholics in New York City, Catholics in New York State, Protestants in Arkansas, um, to help bring about change in Northern Ireland. She never thought of this as public-private partnerships. She's, she sees this as problem solving. Uh, and it's just who she is. So having her as a boss has been a, a tremendous thing. Our office, um, we're focused really on four major initiatives. We have a, a global alliance for clean cook stoves. Look it up on the internet if you want to see it. It's housed within the UN Foundation. Tremendously successful. Um, just getting launched. I'm not going to spend time on talking about it here. We have a, a diaspora program that we're running for the secretary. We uh, held a diaspora forum this past spring. We launched a new um, idea marketplace, it's our idea, it's the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance. We learned our lessons from the Western Union USAID um, marketplace idea. We've launched one in the Caribbean as well with Scotiabank, IDB, uh, and Digicel. Um, we are branching out further in Latin America with La Idea, which was launched this past week on Monday. Uh, again, more work on diaspora. 62 million Americans in the United States are first or second generation Americans. One fifth of our population. We have a tremendous potential of working with our own communities in both diplomacy as well as development abroad. We now get that at state. Uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton gets that and she wants us to do more in this space. So we're, we're working hard on, on making IDEA a successful model that will last long past her tenure, um, which, which sadly is only one more year, uh, a little over a year, considering she's already said she's not staying, no matter what happens next November. Um, we have uh, two other partnerships that we're running. One is a Partners for a New Beginning, which is our outreach to Muslim communities. We just held this past week a Tunisia uh, partnership forum, uh, where we brought philanthropy, business, civil society, entrepreneurs, venture capital together for uh, an event at the State Department. Um, deals have already been cut coming out of that. Connections are made. That's what this is about. It's about bringing people together. That's what the State Department can do. We're a, a convener, a catalyst, and occasionally a collaborator in making these partnerships work. What I really want to talk about briefly is, uh, and I'll follow up with more comments on it, is not something that's tried and tested. It's something new and forthcoming. In January, the Department of State is going to host, for the first time ever, uh, an Investing with Impact Summit. Hopefully, we'll be doing this with GW. Um, we are really interested in this topic. We think uh, as we have opportunities in the middle-income countries, as we see foreign assistance waning in um, some countries, we're going to be looking for new development models. What we're looking at first is launching a business hub. Um, if we close a USAID mission in Brazil, and I'm not saying what we are, um, but if we were to close out of a USAID in Brazil, 
we want to have a leave behind. And what we see as the potential is kind of an embassy of the future and creating a business-to-business -business service organization that has direct ties to our embassy. Our embassies advocate for US businesses abroad. It's part of our work. Um, businesses come and talk to us all the time about the fact that they're either going to enter into new markets or that they're having problems or the types of CSR programs that they're doing, today's type of CSR programs that they're interested in doing. What we found is they don't talk with one another. Um, and what we see as a natural piece for what the department can do for our economic offices is to bring them together. So we're going to launch a new business services center, first of its kind, in Brazil that will bring um, multiple businesses together uh, on different platforms. One of the things that we're looking at, if you look across uh, an ag value chain, um, you've got a number of companies that might exist in this value chain, from Monsanto, Dow Chemical, uh, Pioneer, you've got uh, McDonald's and Walmart on the back end, Cargill, uh, missing someone on the middle. Um, you got a number of companies that are all invested in the ag value chain. What we found is, from the department's perspective, they're all doing English language training in Brazil, uh, all separately. We actually can bring these folks together and do it cheaper and have a bigger impact by working together uh, and by working through what some of the departments are already programming on, in, on English language. So that's what we're going to set up this new business service center hub, uh, and that's what our focus is going to be. The secretary will announce this, so I'm pre-announcing it. Um, but she'll announce the creation of this in January, and uh, we already have partners lined up. Uh, we're looking for additional founding partners for this, and I think it's going to be sort of what the embassy of the future will look like, a more engaged embassy that's going to be doing constituent services, but also looking at business opportunities on the ground. Great. All right. Thanks so much. So we had descriptions of two specific projects, right, that are going on, some really innovative ideas. Um, a good description of some new attitudes and new technologies that might be used as we take it on. And we asked for kind of pushing the envelope and cutting edge, so I don't think you can ask for more than that. We had the idea of a hub which has yet to be created yet, but is uh, kind of framing out some new ideas. So we we're going to do a second round, but I think with time going, I'm going to just stop and then look for the um, audience to ask questions. You know, I kind of have my own curiosity of Bob, like I say, what at least as we think of the two projects and maybe thinking some of the comments, what is it, although they're innovative, but what would be the value added, you know, for doing it that way? Maybe there's something inside of them in terms of what Western Union doing or Oxfam that said that that was the thing that made the difference as people think to model it and all that. But so if you might just take one minute and so briefly just to say what thing you think is most interesting about it, and then I'll turn to questions to people. Mm -hmm. Great. To, to build on my last response, um, where we took this with uh, Swiss Re as a partner in particular, uh, but potentially with others, is uh, to a policy advocacy partnership. Um, and so it's about thinking about what we engage with on the ground. If we are really committed to a structural and systemic solution, it, it is already an expanding program. We've already renamed it R4. We've partnered with the UN World Food Program, and we're going to take it to Senegal and hopefully to other countries soon. Um, AID is already supporting um, World Food Program in that expansion. Uh, so exciting scale happening programmatically, and yet um, does Congress know about it, for example? And do they need to just keep hearing about it from Oxfam, or are there other voices that might be able to convey a, um, a sense that there's a business case for development broadly, that there's a business case for investing in climate change adaptation programs, um, and any number of areas where we can engage in a policy advocacy as sort of the 2.0 of the partnership because uh, we know that policy and government for all of its challenges and flaws uh, is how we can um, uh, cut across the board, that we can reach many more with, with um, a set of solutions. And so I can say more detail, you know, if there, there are questions about it as to what we've actually done, undertaken with Swiss Re in that arena, but that's exciting. It feels what we call, it's, it's political entrepreneurship, and you don't hear that term very often because uh, it's, this is at the, you know, the folks up here are at the cutting edge of thinking about policy and politics in a different light, and we like to think about how we can address it um, through through these partnerships. Yeah. That's great, thanks. So Barb, like I said, just might take a minute. Yep. Uh, one of the things I stressed already is that the money is going directly to the entrepreneurs who are actually starting these businesses, and that's really a change. That one-to-one -one kind of relationship is not the typical relationship for any government agency. 
partnership. So this was really a step forward in that evolution, truly, of that overused word partnership. But the other thing is that we love our partners, and we were uh, founders of uh, one of the founding investors in the IDEA Initiative, which uh, we expect to see great things from. Um, we love uh, our partnership with USAID, but at the same time, we still have breakthroughs uh, that we have yet to make uh, in uh, working with the government, um, with the government initiatives out there. And a couple examples I'll give you are. Uh, one of the winners of the first African diaspora marketplace, breakthrough with clean cook stoves uh, in Uganda for individuals and in going over there, meeting with folks, uh, creating stoves for villages. Not only, and by the way, he launched his business before the launch of the clean cook stoves initiative that was mentioned. Not only is this entrepreneur that has been funded on the one side by a public-private partnership with an agency not being supported in any way through the Clean Cook Stoves Initiative, but in some ways, some of what's going on there, which is, which is a, a great initiative and, and really going to be time well spent, but in many ways it's competing against <coughs> this winner from another, from another initiative within the same agency. Uh, likewise, there's funding from, there's a lot of focus from uh, many government uh, development agencies right now around mobile, use mobile phones for innovation. We as a company, uh, we operate in the mobile phone space in that we did the first cross-border remittances on the planet, and that was just in 2009, and we're a partner with Safaricom uh, in Africa also. Yet a lot of the funding of these innovative mobile initiatives uh, are actually competing against private sector investment in, uh, in initiatives that can help in very much the same way. So how do we uh, bring, you know, create that uh, a collaboration with initiatives that are taking place and competing against some other initiatives that are being funded? That's, a, that's the next step that we have to figure out. Okay, thank you. So, questions for the panelists? Yes? Hi, I'm Maria Baldoff. I'm currently with the Corporate Executive Board. I come from the public sector before that. Um, I'm just sort of interested, as you look at the horizon of what's next and like you dreaming about like what you would ideally do, um, what are some of the things that you're thinking of that you would love to do in the future? Or who, who would you love to partner with if you had any ideas on that? Is there one panelist in particular? Did, were you looking for all four? That's a fairly broad question. Like answering it. <laughs> right, well, maybe was anyone particularly struck by something? Did you? Yeah. Um, <coughs> next up for us, yeah. youth. Um, a definite focus on youth and youth engagement. Um, and with the giant youth bulge, um, we need to do more on jobs. Which we're seeing this in the Arab Spring. It didn't come about just because of repression. It really came about because there's a lot of unemployed youth. Um, so we're, there's a real focus on youth and youth engagement. Um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender inclusiveness. I think that's going to be a big focus of us at the State Department. We will launch an LGBT fund this year uh, at State and host a forum for the first time ever. Uh, and then the last one that I would suggest, oh, no, third one, can't think of it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, uh, yes, please, and the front. Uh, I, uh, Shahana Kanodia from Boston. I had a question for Barbara about um, your model that you're looking at for uh, the startup competition. Is there also uh, an idea to do more of incubation after the, after the uh, initial funding? I'm just thinking of the mass challenge sort of model, which is a public-private partnership in Massachusetts, which has a business plan competition that's global, but also has on the back end incubation model to create companies in Massachusetts that have been taken up as a national initiative. There are some ways in which the pilot fell short. We, the goal was to have uh, technical assistance, mentoring, and incubation all as part of it in the process of the business plan development, but especially on the back end, as you say. Um, we fell short on that. There were uh, other, there were some partners uh, with which we uh, engaged or some existing uh, uh, programs with which we tried to engage. They didn't come through. This time, we are engaging differently. There are, gov uh, in Africa, there are government-based business incubators. We're also reaching out, we start a roadshow on November 30th, 
seven U.S. cities where these diaspora uh, come from. And we're finding that uh, city economic development boards and some states, uh, they have business incubators and economic development um, uh, initiatives that we're trying to tap into. Because at the end of the day, you know, these, these entrepreneurs are coming from the United States and they're investing in Africa. And a lot of the initial materials and expertise is acquired from other small businesses and incubating ideas here in the U.S. So it benefits on this side. So we're trying to tap into the, the city and uh, state government uh, incubators on this side and then those uh, where they exist in uh, uh, governments on, uh, on the other side in Africa, as well as private foundations. There are a couple that have uh, business incubators. We'll make an announcement on Monday for one of those in Africa. Good. Well, and I just wanted to say, I think it's an interesting dimension that when you start these partnerships, and I think some of that discussion was in the last panel, but if you are looking for resources, because many times there's not enough initially, it's really amazing how many sources out there, how many people might have something that you could reach out to, engage, and have them do what they already want to do, right, but bring them into your sphere. And it's amazing how often, if you keep looking, you run into people, and almost so the partnership almost seems to grow as you're able to add capacity of other people into it. It makes it more complicated, right, and more difficult, but more successful, hopefully, in the end. Yeah, it's hard to find them, though. I mean, we're always putting. That's why we're doing some city tour. We're yep. trying to find them to bring them in. We're very approachable that way. Excellent. But the partnership yes. is. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Pauline and Galska with uh, DC Professional uh, Chapter. I have a question, uh, probably for Barbara and Jim, but of course any other um, panelists are welcome to uh, comment. And it kind of continues on the topic of, of diaspora. I'm really curious of any learnings that you may have had going from diaspora to diaspora and sort of cultural differences. I'm partly also asking because um, about seven years ago, I was working at Ashoka, and myself being Polish, I moved here when I was 14, and being quite involved previously in Boston Polish community, we did put a lot of thought into it. It flopped um, for several reasons. You know, I'm not convinced that it flopped because it couldn't be done. <coughs> Perhaps we just were not doing it the right way. But partly, I think it was uh, sort of my cultural resistance to that type of activity. But perhaps I'm wrong. So I would love to hear of any sort of you know, examples that, if, 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 they, or if they exist, where one culture is more kind of, uh, it's better to, you know, to, to involve in that, uh, in, in initiatives of that sort. Would you like to answer first, or you want me to? Oh, ladies first, go ahead. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an assumption, but <laughs> I am a lady, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, the African diaspora marketplace isn't, isn't our first move into this kind of initiative. We started with a program called 4 Plus 1 in Mexico. And that was working, uh, and the approach with the uh, Mexican community, as with some of the other uh, Honduran and some of the other Latin American communities, was uh, really more a collective approach. Hometown associations collecting and pulling funds to, uh, to contribute to uh, uh, projects or businesses on the ground there. And uh, the success outcomes uh, <coughs> very different, but that was a cultural thing where it is more of a collective approach, and so that's the way uh, we approached it. And there are more micro enterprises and, and less of that really incubator technical assistance aspect that we're finding is going to be very successful with the various African communities. And the Polish community, I don't know if you were here for the first uh, session of the day, <laughs> so if you tried that seven years ago, you would have uh, been a ahead of your time with the venture funds that uh, are being invested over in Poland right now. So in part, it's a cultural difference. Um, uh, you may have run into issues. In part, it may have been a timing difference as Poland entered, and this is something Western Union sees, as Poland uh, entered uh, the EU, a lot of Polish uh, uh, population were finding they were able to move around to other cr countries to pursue their career paths uh, as they wished to when that wasn't available uh, in business in Poland. So rather than doing that kind of an investment there in diaspora looking to invest there, 
they were moving around to other places. We saw that in the populations moving and sending back remittances. So part cultural and part what is going on at the time in relation to the own country. Jim, did you have a? Yeah, just quickly. Um, one of the reasons we held a diaspora forum uh, this past spring was we saw what we call the I countries being really successful. India, Ireland, Israel, uh, really successful in mobilizing um, their communities here in the United States um, to influence events at home, also huge remittance um, generation. And we said, why is this not happening with other communities? How can we how can we do lessons learned among other communities? How can we take these experiences from the Irish Americans, from the Global Scott, and impart them upon other communities? And that's that's why we brought these communities together. And we had over 60, actually there was over 80 different communities come to the department in, in the first ever diaspora forum. It was um, great. Yeah, and it really was just a tremendous opportunity. And, and, and that's why we've launched this IDEA platform, this International Diaspora Engagement Alliance, um, to be able to link communities together so that we can share some lessons learned. The same thing actually applies in the LGBT work that we're seeing. Poland is a, is a great example. I mean, we're, we're, there was such a, uh, a difficult time with the government in Poland on LGBT issues, only to see the community rise up and be so successful in turning the corner in Poland around LGBT. So my question is whether or not we can impart the Polish experience and bring it to places that are having a more difficult time with this. Excellent. So maybe time for one one more, Bobby, do we? One more question? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Nicholas Eichmann with Aptos. This is for Dennis Woodall. I liked a lot uh, how you kind of laid out the, we'll say, renaissance and development. In development, we hear a lot about market-based solutions, and it seems like um, some people want market-based solutions to solve a lot of problems that are just plain unrealistic. Um, if we're thinking along those lines, I think we need to really differentiate what is relief and what is development. And with that in mind, what do you see as some realistic expectations from the public side of a public-private partnership of what market-based solutions can actually accomplish? I guess the first thing I might say is market, using market-like mechanisms is not the same, does not mean that it has to be a private sector entity. So what uh, Western Union funded were private sector entities, which is good in many cases. But as you say, in other cases, you can't get private sector entities to do things. The good thing about pri funding private sector entities is that there's a market mechanism that shows Western Union whether they're succeeding or not. So you don't have to do uh, a huge amount of monitoring. You can just find out if they're profitable or not. Uh, that same thing does not hold true for a lot of other things, including relief work. So markets work because producers provide a service or a good, and the market, whoever's consuming it, sends signals back about whether they like it or not. In the private sector, they send signals back by buying things and giving you money or not giving you money. That's a really powerful signal. <clears throat> For a lot of public sector things, you don't get that signal. And so I think that the type of feedback mechanisms that I'm talking about can help provide a market-like signal about quality and relevance of what's being provided. You go into a lot of aid agencies now, and they have, uh, including, and I help develop some of these things, like a balanced scorecard. How are we doing? And there's four quadrants or sectors to this piece of paper. And there's all sorts of financial stuff and, and uh, you know, there's, it's really a lot of data on there. But what's missing, I think, is a fifth sector of data. And that's that, what do people think about? What do the beneficiaries actually think about what they're getting? So think about today. We've all told you these stories. You have no idea whether they're true or not. <laughs> you really don't. And I, I'm tell, after 25 or 30 years in this business, I'm very good at spinning a story. I can build you an embassy of the future that nobody comes to, but if you hear me talk about it, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. We're, we're, we're on the verge of having this fifth sector that's, I mean, can you imagine if I were sitting here and projected behind me where people's, uh, uh, were beneficiaries, uh, or, you know, embassy attendees' reactions to what I was saying, uh, <laughs> there at this fifth sector that's behind me. That would really rock the world of development aid. That would fundamentally change it. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that. 
sounds like a new reality show or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Development's got talent or something like that. <laughs> See how long you can last. Good. Well, I want to thank all the panelists. It wasn't an easy charge to ask for something, right? That's really kind of cutting edge and different, but clearly you responded so well with two very interesting and specific projects and with some really interesting ideas about using technology and new attitudes about doing it. And Jim with review of what's going on and some new thoughts that are coming down the line for the project. So I think that was just excellent. I want to thank all the panelists. If we can. Thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you to Bobby. Thank you to John. Thank you to everybody else who's been a part of this this endeavor. Um, it's it's such a wonderful uh, uh, thing to be a part of schools and institutions that that do things uh, that you kind of can swoop in and see the intellectual excite excitement of, but you don't actually um, realize how much work goes on behind the scenes. And so uh, I also see that Reed Click is here, and uh, I know that Reed has done so much with cyber and everyone else. I mean, it's, it's just everybody is, I, I, I really, every time I come into these events, I feel so moved by the amount of work that goes into them. And these are the things that make not only academic institutions great, but they also make the partnerships between academic institutions and the, the organizations outside of them great. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to come to Washington, D.C., is because I wanted to be in a place in which we were deeply embedded in a set of environments in which we could reach out to organizations uh, and have these kinds of dialogues and have these kinds of engagements that just were, were really at, at the intersection of business and society and business and social policy and really thinking deeply about the role of business in the future. Um, now, th this particular topic is a, a little bit of, of, of painful to me, especially to swoop in at the end, because I would have loved to have been here uh, the entire day, because this particular area is an area that's very close to my heart. Um, I, I'm very much, my, my original identity and uh, intellectual life before I became a dean was as a China scholar. Uh, I've thought a lot about emerging markets and in particular with respect to management education, but also more generally with respect to things like how we analyze and understand the public-private partnerships that actually push the emerging world forward and how the emerging economies are actually pushing us to think differently about what it is that we do. Um, and you, you just this is to me what the future of the global economy is about. Now in some ways it's interesting to me for, from the business school perspective because for the last uh, five or so years the real uh, conversation around these issues has been has grown out of C.K. Prowlin's work, the, the late C.K. Prowlin from the University of Michigan, uh, his work on the bottom of the pyramid. And everybody has caught the idea that yes it's important to think about this major market of people who make less than two dollars and fifty cents a day and man we can make money off that right but in my opinion that's not even the interesting question the interesting question is the fact that the infrastructure of development and the business behind the infrastructure of development is probably the most important thing that's going on in the global economy today and that set of issue can only occur through very very deep relationships through the private sector and through public organizations and it takes all different forms in different countries I mean as a China scholar I look uh, very closely at China's investments around the world and think about the ways in which it's been investing in infrastructural development in Africa uh, from the US perspective we have lots of ways of thinking about these kinds of issues that derive from, to some extent from the public sector but also from the private sector and so there's many many different things that I just think are are at, at the heart of what we can think about creative economic development that are also so important for what the future of the global economy is really about. Uh, and so it's just, it's just so exciting for me to kind of see groups of people coming together to talk about these kinds of issues and to think about them not just in terms of how much money to be is to be made out there and what the market is, but also in terms of issues of development social responsibility, sustainability, food, water, all of the kinds of things that are actually going to really be putting pressures on the global economy uh, in, in a very short amount of time, if not already. Uh, and so I, I just, it thrills me to see uh, these kinds of partnerships. It thrills me as, as a person who's just a part of the George Washington School of Business and George Washington University to be a part of these kinds of things. 
Um, and uh, I just thank you all. I thank you all for, I wish I could have been here to hear your comments. I just caught the tail end of it, but I thank everybody in the, in the room for, for participating, and I thank, uh, thank you all for, for, uh, for sharing knowledge. So.